much uh, the tradition of bain de ciné in France and in Belgium. That's really what's fueling this, this wealth of very interesting work, comics work about displacement and, and, um, and uh, migration, forced migration. Whereas in the West, in the English language, other than Olivier, there are a handful of artists that are doing it because comics is not the kind of, um, it doesn't have that deep tradition in, in British culture, but we'll talk about that. <clears throat> Um, so I'm not going to show you my work. I'm going to just talk about other people's work. Uh, this is a cover from uh, Thi Bui, uh, her graphic novel about being a Vietnamese refugee uh, in the U.S. and coming with her family. Um, the novel, The Best We Could Do, um, was her family story that took her uh, a decade to write. And one of the reasons why it took her a decade to write was that um, she, as a graduate student, she was researching um, experience, the Vietnamese experience in America, the Vietnam War, and she said that all she could find when she was a graduate student was that the material was American-centric, male-centric, and soldier-centric. Her comments resonated with me because I come from an extended Jordanian, uh, mainly Jordanian uh, family in Akron, Ohio. My mother's Filipino. And when I was growing up in the American Midwest and eventually moved to Britain in the 1980s, the available research material on the Middle East uh, was dominated by academic or political tomes. These had a similar bent to those which confronted Bui, American, uh, male-centric, uh, from the American point of view, but it was male-centric. Okay, it wasn't the American soldier at war except in Iraq, but it was war after war, conflict after conflict. And it always seemed to me that Western analysts were more interested in figuring out the winners so the governments could woo the, so, you know, Western governments could woo the next dictator. The great fictional canon uh, from the region, which had been translated into English, was also male-dominated, with the odd feminist or marginal voice thrown in. Interestingly, you know, in an area of the world filled with draconian regimes, almost non-existence was prison memoir. I remember in the late 1990s uh, looking in London for Arab cartoons for a book I was editing for the Prince Klaus Fund. All I found was a, a single book of criticism published by, of all places, the University of Indiana Press. Uh, it was called Com Arab Comic Strips, Politics of an Emerging Mass Market by um, uh, Alan uh, yeah, Douglas, Alan Douglas, but also uh, Fedwa Multi Douglas, who won a big humanitarian award in the U.S. So that was the only book that I, ha I could reference. And then I also found a catalog of a pan-Arab editorial cartoons from an exhibition put on by a Saudi newspaper. Since London was the capital of Arab cartoonists in exile, as Paris was for North African cartoonists fleeing their own governments. It would be another decade before the research situation changed. To be honest, the underground culture has always been here in the region. But for us over there in the West, it, it suddenly became visible, in part because of the internet, but probably it would not have made the impact it did if not for the mass demonstrations of 2011, which gave a shape and a voice to a generation for the most part ignored by Western analysts. So many people, so many academics told me in London, so many people I knew that were lecturing and, and uh, working in the field, you know, how the, the Arab Spring stroke Arab awakenings completely surprised them. Throughout my own work, I've been looking for notions of the Arab family, which didn't have to necessarily conform to the same mixed experience I had, but at least I was looking for something that interrogated patriarchal, social, and religious structures surrounding the family. The terrorist has always had uh, taken center stage in Western conceptions of the region, while the Arab family has been for the most part ignored and invisible. Again, it would be a war that would tip the balance another way. Um, 
Uh, because of the Syrian conflict, a new crop of graphic novels have at their center the Arab family in flux. The first, uh, the first uh, a title that I want to talk about uh, is Brothers of the Gun, a memoir of the Syrian war. And it was, this, this memoir was born out of a very powerful relationship between Syrian activist uh, and writer Marwan Hisham in Raqqa a native son of Raqqa, Al Raqqa, and the activist illustrator Mo Molly Crabapple in New York City. Originally, uh, Crabapple drew scenes of, of Raqqa during Dash's occupation of the city from photographs that Hisham sent to her surreptitiously. These were published in Vanity Fair and began a trend um, of engaged illustration that's, that's pre, I think pretty much it's rare in mainstream U.S. publications. So there, there was a ground opening up that Molly opened and also Olivier opened too with his work. Um, Molly Crabapple, as uh, Lena said, will be with us on Monday. Um, but until then, I, I wanted to sort of, I, I, I don't know uh, how much people do know their, her work, but I wanted to um, show some of her early work. When I was doing a book called Serious Speaks Art and Culture from the Frontline, um, her work at that time was, was very influential in terms of how I was looking at new visual culture coming out of the Syrian revolution because it was showing us something that we don't normally get to see because there was like, there was like a news blackout from that when, when IS was, was there. Um, and... Um, Hold on, I lost my place. <laughs> uh, and, and, and also, th this work, it was, she was showing um, through, through uh, uh, Hisham's photographs, it was, she was showing a displacement of a people who were still living in a town that changed around them. It was a different kind of displacement where the physical plant might have been the same, but the meaning of what constitute public space had been radically altered. In Brothers of the Gun, it is Hasham's description of his family and of his two friends, which give a fuller picture of how a town as conservative and religious as Al Raqqa produced a generation of rebels. The second uh, a book I'm interested in looking at is Threads from the Refugee Crisis by Kate Evans. And it is a graphic novel that documents the artists working in the jungle, the refugee camp of Calais that was brutally closed in 2017 after a mere 21 months in operation. The families she shows are fractured or extended, rarely nuclear, heavily mixed with the nationalities of people fleeing Asia and Africa, men, women, children, the dispossessed, the depressed, and at times the heavily pregnant. The third book that I was interested in is Unwanted, uh, Stories of the Syrian Refugees, written and illustrated by Don Brown, which, shows, which really charts the movement of Syrians on the move, uh, refugees on the move through a hostile and brutal Europe. And it's here I kind of want to digress, um, and I want to talk about form. Since 2015, there have been hundreds of thousands of images still in moving. Uh, showing forced migration and displacement. Yet not even the disturbing image of a three-year-old uh, washed up on a Greek beach uh, was not enough to really dent, and some would say it even fueled the hysteria of the hard right in Europe and the U.S. This, I've, I've been kind of wondering about this. Like, how come all this, like, documentary imagery, right, how come that wasn't enough to spur international governments? How come this wasn't solved? Why was it that armies were, you know, navies were involved and boats were confiscated, but the actual crisis was not, you know, tackled head on? And I wonder, for me, I was wondering that I don't think it was a failure of the imagery, but perhaps a failure of the delivery of the imagery. In short articles that no one has the patience to read on the internet, or in picture essays, and, and, and our press in, in, in London now or in other places is becoming quite thin. So um, it really, like, we, we had to rely on other forms of storytelling for, for a wider view on this crisis to come to the fore. 
And it really is this, I feel that in graphic novels, in illustrated memoirs, you have like a much broader, wider, deeper space to really um, look at the range and depth of human emotion and experience. I mean, the, the, the uh, imagery that Olivier was showing us, the, the detail in the, uh, not only what people are saying, but, but how, the, how this, this story or how this scene is, is fully, not, not described because in part it is their own words, but how you get a full sense even of someone hiding under the blankets. And I think that's something that somehow, it's that kind of uh, real life narrative that we're missing in a lot of the media that we're getting today. Um, and how that can be fixed, I don't know. Um, let's move on. Um, in Britain during the World Wars, there's always been a tradition of illustrators drawing conflict, um, even avant-garde, artists alongside painters known for society portraiture, like John Singer Sargent, were uh, sent to draw the trenches. In the, gra in, in the graphic novel Threads from the Refugee Crisis uh, by Kate Evans, she herself appears in the book and, it, and she is showing what she does in the jungle as a character. Um, so it's through her eyes that we feel the outrage. She, she, she tells stories of the people there, but she pops up to sort of give us an idea of how sort of, I don't know, the illustrator as a medium to sort of channel that emotion and kind of tell us how we should feel. Alongside her experiences, along, the, the chapter, the, the book is divided in chapters, but each chapter sort of begins with like a picture of a mobile phone and text. And these are comments from people who have sent her anti-immigration or anti-refugee messages. So her graphic novel is as much about the people in the jungle uh, attempting to get to the UK as it is about the people who believe that they shouldn't be there. Um, now, Don Brown is a well-known illustrator for children and young adults. And th there's a, a real simplicity uh, of line in his graphic novel. And I feel that in parts it's very cinematic. However, the graphic novel, uh, his novel, comes into its own in the, in, at the end of the book with the research and source material and extensive bibliography and geographical notes of, where, of, of what Brown's looking at, where he went, what he, where he drew. His activism shows up, one could say, in his subject matter. It is a book that teachers could use in class, a trend in the U.S., um, that even the New York Times and Brown University, they're preparing these teacher's packs that people can, can use in classrooms. And the New York Times is, is doing that really because of, um, you know, that it was, a, it was a, uh, an article that they ran by uh, Jake uh, Halpern and Mike, uh, Michael Sloan uh, called The New World, um, about a Syri Welcome to the New World, about a Syrian refugee family. Um, and so this material is becoming more widespread. Um, but I really feel that this visibility of this kind of material would not have gained, gained mainstream acceptance if not for, the, for this new engaged drawing and activism of Molly Crabapple and Olivier, and, and they're setting a high bar. Um, in, Molly's wor in, in Crabapple's work from Syria and Iraq, among other countries, her subjects themselves are not only what makes her work engaged, her illustration and Olivier's too provides a platform for other voices without mediation, too much mediation from the, 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 from the, the illustrators, what they're thinking, how they interpret it. It's their line that tells us what's going on. Um, and at the end of The Wanted by Don Brown, he reveals in pointed statistics that there are nearly six million registered Syrian refugees in the world and as of April last year, the U.S. has taken 11. This paltry figure emphasizes why graphic novels and illustrated memoirs remain so important to modern narratives of displacement, dislocation, and loss today. Graphic novels and, but to close, graphic novels and comic strips by activists, illustrators, and graphic artists 
lay bare the full human cost of the tragedy uh, in a region of the world, uh, in, in a region and the rest of the world that seems to be continually at war, um, with drawing and reporting that takes place close to the ground. As people grow bored with the real and believe news that, and believe that the news can't be trusted, drawing and illustration, not photography, film or news broadcast or rolling news uh, are worth more than a thousand words. Thank you. <laughs>